you this morning. We're going to be talking about identity. <clears throat> Pardon my voice this morning. <laughs> I'm still kind of recovering from a little bit of something. So if I'm a little scratchy, it will get better next week. But we're talking about identity. And we're on to part six. And the title of this one is Who Am I? And this is so, such an interesting question because we don't often remember or know or have a really good answer to this. I want you to think about in the moment, you don't necessarily say it out loud, but think about for a moment, if somebody looked, came up to you and said, who am I? What's your answer? What does that look like when somebody comes up and says, Roger, who are you? It's kind of an ambiguous question, isn't it? It's like, well, This is who I am, right? You, you don't really know what to say, so what do you end up doing? Most people start describing themselves. Well, I work here. I do this. I would say 99% of the time when I ask somebody that question, they start off with their occupation. Well, I'm a, I'm a power engineer, or I'm a roofer, or I'm a, I'm a doctor, or whatever. And they normally start that way, and then, then you find that they kind of go down the road. And I'm also a dad, and, or, and I'm also a husband, and I'm also this, and I'm also that. And they kind of work their way down. And it's really interesting, because the first word that comes to your mind is often that which you tie your identity to the most. When somebody asks who you are, I experienced this when I was going to ask my wife's, my now wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, her father, to just let him know my expectations. I was coming to him and say, look, I want to marry your daughter. And he responded with this question, who are you? He's like, I don't know you from a hole in the ground. Why are you wasting the oxygen at my dinner table? This is what he said to me. So I proceeded to tell him who I was. But it was, it was an interesting question that stuck with me because my first answer was, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a king's kid. Now, naturally, he wanted to know a little bit more than that. But this is, the, it got me thinking to the point where, because I wanted to say my occupation because I figured that's what he was looking for. I figured he was looking for, can this man support my wife? But here's the thing. God had to shift some perspectives in me because if he's looking for a man who can support his wife, that man's identity should be found in Christ, not his job. So it started to shift some things in me. We like to, an we like to give the answer to the question we think people need. And let me tell you something. In this world, people need Christ more than they need to know what you do for a living. People need to know who you love, who you would lay your life down for, what is valuable to you. You see, this, this, this Christian walk, this, the, what we do, who we are, how we live, is so important that if you are not willing to look and say, God, I'm choosing you first, what's the point? God's not interested in part-time Christians. We talk, I'm going to go through a quick review, and then we're going to go into this. But this is, this is so important because so many Christians, I think, lack or don't go to church or they don't, see exper they don't experience what God wants for them or they don't, they don't walk the way God, they, they, they hear the promises that God is good and he wants all these things for you, but you don't see it. I think the reason we don't see it is because our identity is not in him. Because we're identifying with whomever else we're around or whatever else we do. Here's the thing, when your identity is tied to your job, your job is your supply. When your identity is tied to your spouse, your spouse is your supply. When your identity is tied to your children, your children are your supply. This is a problem because they can only give so much to you. They can only take you so far. After a certain point, you'll be dissatisfied. And let me be clear, every single one of us, myself, Every single one of you is designed by God to want to tie their identity to something. It's a need in every single person. So let's review a few things. This is what we've seen so far. So we looked at what is identity. What is identity? It means thisness. That's literally the translation in the English word. It means that whatever you tie yourself to becomes who you are. 
Every single one of us was designed to have this. We want to tie ourselves to something. I gave the likening of one of those fuzzy balls and those little Velcro rackets. Whatever you tie yourself to, wherever that racket goes, you go. Right? If your job says, I want you to go here, and you're tied to your job, it's going to go wherever you want. Here's the problem, is that when everything else is gone, and you're separated from that job, you now have no identity. And the thing is, is in North America, it's so easy to tie our identities to so many different things. There's a reason why in North America, we have the highest suicide rate, or one of the highest suicide rates on the planet. Because there's so many things to tie ourselves to. But here's the thing. If you took everything else away and all you were left with was God, is that enough? You lost your home. You lost your family. You lost everything. You're like Job sitting there with absolutely nothing left. Is God enough? Is who he is enough to you? Because if not, what you're going to do is you're going to take your identity and you're going to plug it into what is more important. And a lot of Christians today would rather be at the beach than in church on Sunday. I'm not saying it's wrong to go to the beach. I'm saying where's your heart at? It's not wrong to go watch the, the game, but if you're thinking about the football game after church, and rather than thinking about what's happening in church, where's your heart at? If you're, if the, there's, this isn't happening much in our church, but if you're thinking about, uh, for those of you online, if you're thinking about the cute girl three aisles over, the entire time service is going on, rather than talking about what the pastor is preaching and letting it influence your heart, where's your heart at? So number one was, we looked at was identity, which was thisness. The second one we looked at was identifying with Christ. Okay? This was the next part. You need to take your thisness and you need to stick it to Jesus. You need to let him be the one that gives you the identity. You need to let him be the one that defines you, that allows you to become who you are. When somebody asks you to describe yourself or the qualities you talk about, those that are like Christ or those that are like the world, when they ask what movies you like, are they ones that Christ would watch? or are they ones? I don't think Christ would watch a movie. But the point is, are, is everything you do a reflection of your relationship to him? So we looked at identifying with Christ. How do we do that? We looked at three different things. One of them was disciplining your pursuit. Every time you start something, you need to discipline your pursuit. If you want to go work out, you need to start with discipline. If you want to start becoming a good cook, you need to start with discipline. If you want to be an architect, you need to start with discipline. Everything that you're going to put in front of you as a vision requires discipline to fulfill the vision. So disciplining your pursuit is important. The next one we found out was find out who God is. In the midst of your disciplining of your pursuit, you need to find out who God is so that you can identify with him. Anybody here have any siblings? Yeah? I think everybody here has a sibling. Anybody here an eldest child? Okay, we have a few. The second, you second and third and fourth, those are who I want to talk to real quick. Because we, we eldest children, we don't really get this as easily as you guys do. But sometimes we look up to our older siblings when we're young and say, I want to be just like that. So what do you do? You start mimicking their sayings, even if they're dorky and irritating. You start, you start saying what they say. You start doing what they do. You start following them around. If they're hanging out with friends, guess where you are? You're hanging out with them. As the eldest child, I'm like, no, go away. I don't want my little sister around. Eventually you get over this. But here's the thing. This, these children have this desire to be intimate and have connection with somebody they look up to. At some point along the way, that person stops being God. But what if we were like that, the way we treated our siblings? What if we, or the people we idolize, the people we look at and say, look, I want to be like that guy. What if that guy was Christ? What if everything we did was like, wait a minute, I just want to be like him. I want, to be, I want the success that he has. I want the power that he has. I want the love that he has. I want the ability to lay my life down for others like he, like he has. But if you don't know who God is, you can't identify with him. Just like with your sibling. If you didn't know they were hanging out with their friends, could you follow them? If you didn't know what their sayings were, could you repeat them? 
If you, if you couldn't figure out what their favorite food was so that it could be your favorite food, would you be able to, would you be able to replicate that? No. You have to know. So it starts with your discipline. You have to make that choice and start making discipline moves that will move you towards that. Reading your word, going to church, spending time talking about the word. Finding out who God is. Number three was renewing your mind. Okay? Renewing your mind is, I want you guys to picture it this way. I want you to picture it like a dishwasher. Okay? You're getting rid of everything that has to do with the world and shoving it down the drain and all that's left is what God wants. If God says this is good and this is bad, you need to take what's bad, shove it down the drain, and make what's good your priority. This is what God wants. You ever look at you ever look, have you ever look at somebody else's kids and you're like, dang, you guys look like your you're, you're just like your mom and dad. You ever do that? You ever see that in other people? I definitely see Isaac and Renee. It's like poof, spit an image of Renee. But here's the thing. Because of that, the reason for that is because Isaac looks to those he wants to be led by, those who carry influence with him. The issue is, is sometimes we don't care enough about God or what he thinks to let him be the one we want to mimic rather than maybe our friends or our family. How often do we change who we are to try and keep a relationship that shouldn't be there? How often do we change who we are to keep a job we shouldn't have? How often do we allow ourselves to step into something we shouldn't be stepping into just so that we can fit in? It wasn't that long ago that my wife was at work and one of her coworkers, one of her bosses came up to her and said, wait, when that customer asks you this question, I need you to lie. And Hannah was like, but I can't do that. <laughs> and she's like, no, you need to lie. So the next time it came up, Hannah had a choice to make. And she looked on the phone and she, she decided, I'm not going to lie. And she just kept telling the truth. And she just kept telling the truth. Eventually, her boss was like, oh, okay, well, it seems to be working. But here's the thing. In that moment, Hannah had a choice. Do I represent Christ or do I represent my boss? She was willing to lose the job for Christ. Because there are certain things God's not okay with. And that's one of them. But are we willing to do that? So number one, what is identity? It's thisness, identifying with Christ, which means disciplining your pursuit, finding out who God is, and renewing your mind. There are five sermons on all of those points. They're all online if you're wanting to catch up. Otherwise, we're going to keep moving forward because those are foundational to what we're talking about today. So today we're talking about who am I? Now, if you've done these things, if you've, figured out that you're, maybe your identity is not tied to the right place. Maybe it's, in the, maybe it's tied to your spouse. Maybe it's tied to your job. Maybe it's money. Maybe you love money so much that you're willing to do whatever it takes to get more of it in your life. Whatever it is, you've done that. You've started your discipline. You found out who, you're finding out who God is continually. You're renewing your mind. Maybe you've done this or you've started doing it. Who am I? Who am I now? Why is it important to know this? Why is it important to know who you are? You see, oftentimes you hear in church where somebody says, well, I'm a new creature in Christ. Great, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a new creature in Christ? If you're so excited about it, for all you know, it could mean you're purple. Are you actually purple? No. Why do, who are we? Is, the, is an intimate question that only God can answer. Actually, it's not true. Other people can answer it, but it's not going to give you what you need. We require that answer from God. If you get your who am I from anybody else, you're going to find yourself depressed, lacking, unable to focus, not satisfied, disappointed with everything you see in life. Here's a few reasons why it's important to know who you are. Number one is because it affects what you do. Knowing who you are affects what you do. Number two, knowing who you are affects why you do it. Okay? Number one is it affects what you do. Number two is it affects why you do it. And number three, it affects how you do it. Knowing who you are affects how you do it. 
give you guys a really good example. If you're a Christian and you're stuck in a situation and all of a sudden you need to lie to get out of it, because you're in Christ, you know what you're going to do. You're going to tell the truth. You know why you're going to do it because Christ is in you. You know how you're going to do it with boldness and repentance. Now, if I wasn't a Christian, you know what I would do? I would lie. That's my what? Why would I do it? To protect myself. How would I do it? Deceivingly. Again, with boldness. This is the issue. When our identities are tied, we actually, everybody say this, I will do whatever I'm tied to. If, it's, if your value is here, your actions will reflect that. Let me give you an example of belief. Everybody here believes gravity works, right? B- gravity is a thing. That belief will stop you from walking off the edge of a building if you want to survive, right? Belief affects action. Now, if I were to take all of you up to the moon on one of Elon Musk's spaceships, and we built a 40-story building, and I said, hey, guess what? Gravity here doesn't work like that. You can jump off and not get hurt. Your belief would be in line with that action. You could jump off, and guess what? Because there's no very little gravity, you would sink to the ground without any problems. But your belief is tied to your actions. Now, what happens? here's what the devil tries to do. He tries to say, wait a minute, the moon's gravity is here on earth. I want you to walk off this building. Now, this is an extreme version, but, you know, sometimes the devil will whisper in your ear and say, hey, you know what? Um, if you lie here, you'll get away with it and nobody will hurt you. You'll be safe. Or, you know what? You're going after this girl. If you just lie a little bit about who you are, she'll like you. Oh, you know what? Your children are being... Your children are being difficult. Just, just, just forget about it. Don't discipline them. Don't do anything. They'll love you for it. Here's the thing is the devil's going to whisper the opposite of truth into your life every time. So it's important to know why because it affects what you do, how you do it, and why you do it. Biblical identity in Christ for the purposes of the teaching can be broken down into three major categories. This is going to be extremely important and it's going to be the basis of the next three sermons. Okay, Three major categories. Everybody say identity equals these. Okay, So number one is value. Okay, Identity will always come back to value. That's numero uno. Whenever we're talking about identity, I want you to remember value. Okay, Number two, purpose. Okay? Whenever we're talking about identity, you're going to find that purpose is important in here. And the number three is authority. Okay? Whenever we talk about identity, I want you to break them down into these three groups because this will help you identify why you're doing, how you're doing, and what you're doing. So not only are these things important, but you need to have them in this order. Value first, purpose second, authority third. We're going to go through these into extreme depth over the next three weeks, but I want to give you guys some things to think about. Let's go to the first point here that I've got. So value provides direction for purpose, and purpose gives weight to authority. Let me say this again. Value provides direction for purpose, and purpose gives weight to authority. So I'm not going to go too deep into it, but where do we get our value from as a Christian? Where do we get it from? Christ. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Gave his only son. What's the worth of Christ? Can you put a number on it? His, God sent his son for you. That means your value was Christ's life. If you don't start there, everything else is off. Value provides direction. Because you're valued, you now know which way to start walking. And then when you start, value provides direction for purpose, and purpose gives weight to authority. This is a statement we're going to come back to over the next few weeks, because right now it might seem vague and complicated, but we're going to really break it down. And at the end of the three weeks, you're going to be like, dang, that's true. You can't start with purpose. And you can't start with authority. And here's why. Let's go to my second point. Actually, I didn't check it off. So I'm just going to read it to you. If you start with authority, everybody say value first, purpose second, authority third. 
Here's the problem. If you start with authority, you will use authority to create purpose. You see this a lot. I'm going to pick on the church because that's really where I've got the jurisdiction to work in. <laughs> the world can do whatever they want. But in the church, you're going to find pastors or leaders in the church or elders or people that you might look up to, and they don't know their value and they don't know their purpose, and so you know what they start with is authority. What do they look for? They join a church and they look for position. Position is authority. Out of that position, they get direction, which is their purpose. They, I, they garner their purpose from their authority. Well, I come to church and I'm an usher, which means that I have the authority to kick you out if you're being disruptive. Now all of a sudden authority has given them purpose and now because of that they garner their value from their purpose which is tied to their authority. So what happens is when you take away their authority they're left with nothing. You can't start with authority. This happens in everything in our Christian walk. This is, this is actually a leadership principle. If you put yourself on a pedestal and you think that you're good just because you're the boss you're not going to have anybody following you. You need to start with value. Anybody here ever follow somebody that thinks that they're absolute snot? They don't like you. Like, do you, do you like following somebody who thinks you're worthless? Would you follow them? You might have to work for someone like that, but eventually if you found a better job, guess what? You're gone. This is how it works in the kingdom of God. God's not interested in people who don't, who, if you don't know your value, it's because you don't know him. That doesn't mean that you're, 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 you're done, it's over, blah, 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 blah. It means get to know him, get your value, find out what you're worth. And we're going to talk really in depth about it. Here's the other thing. If you start at purpose, okay, so don't start at authority, it doesn't work. If you start at purpose, you lack any sense of value and, again, can fall into two different categories. If you start at purpose, you can fall into absolutely nothing. And I'm going to say it means you have no purpose, no value, no authority. This kind of person is usually the person that's depressed, going through life, not really existing, doesn't do anything with their life. They go through the motions. They end up in addictions or, or, or brokenness. or they, they just don't achieve anything with their life. And you know what? There's a lot of people like that today. God, that breaks God's heart. You know what? I've been there. I've been the guy who's a youth pastor going through the motions, being like, why am I even here? There's no vision, no passion, no nothing. What's the point? I didn't stay in that season, thank God. <laughs> it's not fun following a leader who doesn't. If you don't have value for yourself, nobody's going to see value in you and ain't nobody going to follow you. And what are we supposed to do? Light and salt. If we're light and salt and you don't know your own value, how in the world is the world going to look at you and say, I want what you have? Don't let the value you have be in yourself. Let it be in who he says you are. Because if you think that you're all that in a bag of potato chips, God's going to come up and he's going to crush your bag of potato chips. And nobody will follow you. You're going to have what you see in the church all the time, hypocrites. People who say one thing and do another. I'm not saying all of the guys don't take that. I'm saying all of the church is like that. I'm saying if you are in the church and you are like that, change. Because God will have a harsher judgment on those who know him and do wrong than those who don't know him and do wrong. But if you know better, just do it. Yeah, it's hard. Yep, you're going to fail. Everybody say, I'm going to fail. Uh, I fail. <laughs> Y'all are going to fail. What happens when you fail? Repent. Get up. Go back. Get up. Go back. If you start with purpose and you lack any sense of value, you're going to fall into a nothingness. No purpose, no value, no authority. Or you're going to do the opposite. Is You're going to use your purpose to establish your value so that you can walk in authority. And again, the problem with this is when you have your purpose be the thing that gives you value, as soon as that purpose is removed, you no longer have value, purpose, or authority. Now you're done again. This happens over and over and over again. It's like, it's like, for example, let's say I put somebody in charge of a women's group. 
And they're like, yes, they're thriving. They're doing great. They're doing amazing. They're walking with God. They're growing. They're doing all this. All of a sudden, I say, you know what? I need to remove you from that position for a little while. And instantly, their entire life falls apart. You know what? Their purpose was found in that rather than in God. Whereas if you're found in God, here's the beautiful part. You can come into positions. You can go out of positions. You can spend time with people. You can come out of people. You can have relationships with people, and you can leave relationships with people. You can do all of these things and never stop growing in Christ because where you're rooted is where you get value from. Where you get value from is what gives you purpose, and what gives you purpose enables you to walk in authority. Why do you think the LGBTQ community grew so quick? You know what they did? Here's the key. Here's what they did. They looked at everybody and said, you're valuable. They gave them identity. Young people who are not getting it from mom and dad, who are not getting it from school, who are not getting it from anything, all of a sudden there's this group saying, if you're like us, we'll love you. And instantly they're trying to go after that value. Because everybody here wants to be valuable. Everybody here wants to be important. Everybody here wants to be seen. Everybody here wants to be known. How do I know this? Because we're created in the image of God. And guess what? God wants to be seen. God wants to be known. And so you know what he's willing to do? He's willing to fulfill that need in you so that you can come to him and be filled by him so that when you go into the world, you can take what he's giving you and extend that to others so that they can feel loved. You know why Christians can't feel, you know why some Christians can't show love? Because they don't feel love. They don't know love. They hate themselves. They don't have relationship with God because if you had relationship with God or a greater relationship with God, you would know how valuable you are. And again, that's not to say that you're stuck. It means get up, go find it. Go after God. Discipline your pursuit. Renew your mind. Get to know Him. Get to know what He says about you. What He did for you. So you can't start with authority. You can't start with purpose. You need to need to need to start at value. So neither of these things are going to leave you in a place where your identity comes from the Father. Okay, if you start with any of these, but it's not rooted in Christ, you're going to find that you're going to be drawn away to the thing that you're valuing. I want you guys to think about something for a moment. I want you to think, even in the last week, what is it that you're drawn to? Like, I'm, This is one thing that I'll give you an example. This is one thing that I've had in my life is I would go to work, but there was always one thing I looked forward to every week. There was always one thing I was excited about. There was always one thing that was constantly on my mind. And when I was a young man, that was Friday night. I got to go home, order a pizza, and play video games till 4 in the morning. That was my thing when I was a young man. I'm still a young man, but I'm talking about a younger man. So my identity was tied to those things. And you know what happened is is the closer I got to God, I'd go to these conferences. I'd get lost in worship. I'd spend time with God. I'd be doing all of this stuff. And you know what? God would encounter me in those moments. But every time I encountered God, you know what he did? He brought this little thing called conviction into my heart. And he said, Jeremiah, I want more of you. But as long as that thing is sitting in first place, you can't have. God was establishing that he wanted to make sure my value was coming from him and not from how good I was at something. We are designed to be desperate for value. We all want to be alone. Let's head over to Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. I want to give you guys some perspective. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 to 16. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let's ambush the innocent without cause. Let's swallow them alive like shoal, even whole like those who go down to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we will have one money bag. My son, do not walk on the way with them. 
Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they are quick to shed blood. Well, Jeremiah, what does that mean? Let's go back to, let's go back to verse 10. I'm going to walk you through it. My, uh, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Let's go to the next one. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. You know what that means, that come with us? This isn't just some random dude walking down the street and being like, hey, I'm going to recruit you. Do you want to come? You know what they're saying is, come be one of us. You can be one of us. You know what that establishes? What are they offering right off the bat? Value. You can come be one of us, and what are we going to do? Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like shoal, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We'll keep reading. We will find all kinds of precious wealth, and we will fill our houses with spoil. What are they offering here? Come be one of us. Let's work together. You know what we're going to be? We're going to be rich. We're going to be rich men. We're going to be men of power. We're going to be men of authority. We're going to have a name. Kind of sounds like a mob boss to me. <laughs> what are they offering? Here, come be one of us. Value. Who, who are you going to be? Rich, powerful. It sounds to me like purpose. How are they going to do it? They're going to kill. They're going to destroy. They're going to ambush. There's your authority. Value, purpose, authority. This is how the enemy works. This is how God works. The thing is, is the enemy is offering you something that's going to tickle the fancy of the flesh. Everybody here wants money. Why do you think Jesus said that the love of money is the root of all evil? Not money itself, the love of money. Because it's important to remember that where we get our value from shouldn't be in money. The Bible says that riches will pass away, so we should store up for ourselves treasures where? In heaven. How do we do that? You go after Christ. This is so important. And I love this because Proverbs is, everybody here, anybody here ever read through Proverbs at least once? So Proverbs is considered the book of wisdom. Okay, this is, I've probably read this book over a hundred times. <laughs> it's one of my favorite books. And you know what I absolutely love about Proverbs is it's talking about what to do to live with what's called godly wisdom, not earthly wisdom. Because earthly wisdom says, wait a minute, money, check. Houses, check. Power, check. This ain't such a bad deal. If you take God out of the picture, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Money, power, riches. Who wouldn't want that? All you got to do is kill somebody or steal. My wife and I were, we were uh, I had a favorite movie when I was growing up and we were thinking about it. It's called Ocean's Eleven. And essentially this movie uh, is about this group of guys who create this plan to go and steal. And I thought it was interesting that like, you're, you're watching this movie and you find yourself rooting for these guys. And then at the end of it, it was like years later that God was like, well, Jeremiah, you know you're rooting for thieves, right? And that instantly shocked me. I'm like, what? No, they're the good guys. He's like, but they're stealing. They're running from the police. And it's, it's so interesting how the world will take something that was actually wrong and you are rooting for the guys doing something wrong. I caught myself in that movie and thought, oh, dang. Clever. Very clever. I wanted to be one of those guys when I was a kid. You see, we sometimes look at the things in the world that gets glorified by the world and we say, I want that, rather than looking at how powerful it is to walk the way God wants you to walk. To be valued. Can you imagine going to bed every night knowing you're loved every single night? You know how many people go to bed at night thinking, who loves me? Who cares about me? You know that God does? That's why he sent Jesus. That's why he established value. That's why he said, you were worth my son. Jesus extended an invitation for you to switch ownership. He's saying, you are currently a slave to sin. I'm willing to make you a slave to righteousness. 
we don't talk a lot about slavery in North America, but let me tell you something. When it comes to slavery, you don't get a choice. You don't have a right. You work for the master. And here's the thing. When sin is your master, you're in trouble. Because sin produces one thing and one thing only. Death. The penalty of sin or the wages of sin is death. What does that mean? It means when you do the work of the enemy, which is sin, anything against God's will, it produces not just a physical death. Well, everybody here is going to die physically. Okay, This life is temporary. What it's talking about is eternal life. I don't want to spend eternal life without God. I don't want to spend it in hell. I don't want to spend it away from the King of Kings. I want to spend it next to Him, worshiping Him. I want to see what He has next. This is just a stepping stone. The Bible doesn't even talk about what happens once His kingdom is established. The last thing we know is God wins, establishes His kingdom, and now there's prosperity for His people. That's where the story ends. You know what? For, or for what we can read, but there's more because God is good. He ain't going to end there. There's more coming. I want to be part of that. I don't want to be sitting in a smelly, dingy, burning jail cell for eternity. I want to be working for the king. I get excited when I think about that. I looked up the other night. I live out in Walsh. There's not a lot of stars. Or there's a lot of stars, sorry. There's not a lot of light in the, in the little town. So I'd go up in my backyard. I'd look up, and it is stars galore. And sometimes I forget the perspective of how small we are and how big God is. Because I like to, I like to think that when God reestablishes his throne, he's going to use us, those who followed him, to go further and do things like what his angels do for him now. That's just my thing. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. That's just what I like to believe. I think we're not done once God gets established. I don't want to be somebody that God's discarding. Don't, don't fool yourselves. I'm, I'm telling you this because I love everybody. If you don't follow Christ, you will not get the kingdom of heaven. It's not for everyone. The Bible says very few will inherit the kingdom of God. And when I say very few, I'm not talking like 10%. It will be a lot less. Because what God Christ said is required for that is a price many are not willing to pay. But when you do, when you do, you can be like Paul at the end of your life. You know what he said? He said, guess what? I've run my race. I've achieved that which was set before me. And I'm excited to go home. Can you imagine having that kind of confidence at the end of your life? There's a fellow who lived not that long ago, Smith Wigglesworth. You know what he did? I, I love this. I told God, I want to go like this. He was like, you know what, God? I think it's time for me to come home. He wrote his kids a letter that night, said, yep, God's taking me home. It's time for me to go. Put the letter beside his bed or beside his nightstand, sat in his chair, and God took him. They found him there just like that. God took him right there. That's how his kids found him. He knew. And he, he didn't go through that pain of death. He didn't go, or at least not what we know of. He died in that chair. God took him right there after he wrote that letter. Can you imagine knowing God so much that it's just, yeah, it's time to go, so I'm done. I've achieved what I needed to achieve. His legacy today is still going strong through his children. You see, but where we put our value is what's important. He had a really interesting rule, and it's actually something that me as a pastor is working towards. He, wouldn't, he didn't let anything worldly into his house. He wouldn't even let newspaper in his house. He said, I don't want news. I don't want secular songs. If it doesn't glorify God, it doesn't come anywhere near me. And as a result, that man did things nobody else could. And it's powerful. I've seen that happen in my life. I've seen what happens when you put God first. I've watched people, I've watched, in when I was a youth pastor, I'll give you guys some testimonies. When I was a youth pastor, we had a girl who came and her wrist was broken. She had a cast on it and everything. She couldn't do anything. She had just broken it that day. She came and we were just so happy to be talking about healing. 
hit the youth group. So we said, you know what, we'll pray for you. So we prayed for a whole bunch of people. We prayed for her, and she was like, well, I'm going to go test it out. She took her cast off. She started playing this, like, it's called red butt. So essentially, if you don't know what that is, it's like dodgeball, kind of. And she was throwing with what was her broken wrist with no pain. It's funny, because like a year later, she broke her wrist again, and she came up to one of my youth leaders, guys, can you pray for me again, because my wrist is broken. She did it in a sporting injury. And you know what? They prayed for her. She pulled it off, and it was healed again. Those kinds of things aren't just fairy tales. And you know what? Sometimes we as Christians are like, well, I prayed and nothing happened. Yeah, God's still good. I've prayed and we've seen those miracles. You know what? I've also prayed and never seen the healing come. That doesn't mean God's not good. God's good. The other thing that happened at that thing was we had a young, a young man in our youth group and uh, we inherited them from another youth group. And that youth pastor came up to me and said, yeah, this young man, he's got a bit of a learning disability. He's going to be really, really hard to work with. I said, oh, I guess we'll see. He was one of the easiest kids to work with. During, this, during this, uh, this prayer meeting, he comes up to me, this kid with a learning disability, he looks at me, can I pray for my little brother? I said, yeah, pray for him. So he had this simple, beautiful prayer, God, please heal him, and just kind of walked away. And I thought, cool, I don't know what the problem was. All he said was, God, please heal him. His dad came to church the next Sunday, and he, he had to come find me because he came and he said, I heard that we pr- you, prayed for, you prayed for people. I said, well, the youth prayed for people. He's like, well, I took my youngest son to the doctor who was scheduled for back surgery, and they couldn't find anything wrong with him. So they had to cancel his surgery because this little guy decided to pray for his brother. But you see, what happened was is we, he found his value in Christ and thought, if God values me enough, maybe if I say something, God will answer. And God did. You see, Jesus talks about this. He says it requires a childlike faith to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know what a child is like? A child looks up and believes everything mom and dad say. Everything mom and dad say. And sometimes we have to be willing to look at God and say, ah, I believe you. It's hard to believe you right now, but I believe you. And I'm going to live like that. I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. I'm going to receive what Jesus did on the cross, and I'm going to turn, repent, and make sure I follow you to the end of my days. We as Christians have a choice to make. We as people, Christians aside, we as people have a, a choice to make. And it's, there's no in-between. It's will I follow God or will I follow everything else? And you know what's included in the everything else? Is your flesh. Your flesh is the one that says, you know what? I want this. I need this. I need this. I want this. You know, I can tell you as somebody who's going through something like that, if you looked at a video of me this time last year, I was a little wider, a little thicker. I wasn't in nearly as good a shape. I was actually in the hospital a little while last year. So you know what God told me? He said, "You've got your body's the temple." I said, "Yeah." He said, "Why are you treating it like garbage?" Okay, I'll change. (laughs) Do you know what? I started working out, started eating better, started taking care of what God wanted me to. Does it suck? Yeah. You know what? I don't like skipping breakfast every day. But you know what happened is God said, "Who is more important?" Your food or me. So when I say that we all have our things to work through, I promise you, it's not just you. Every single one of us has a choice to make. Who do I want to be? Who do I want to live like? Who gives me my value? I go to bed every night and I sleep like a freaking baby because I know when I go to bed, God loves me. I know that if I died in my sleep, I'm going straight to heaven. And that does things. When you have the confidence of Christ in you in the middle of a crisis, you can look at a problem and say, (laughs) you got nothing on me. Absolutely nothing. 
Why? Because you have the confidence that comes from the King of Kings. The Bible says that we can boast in Christ. We can boast in the Lord our God. Do that. Don't boast in your own strength. Don't, let, don't be like the strong man who boasts in his own strength or the rich man who boasts in his riches or the wise man who boasts in his wisdom. Be like the godly man who boasts in the Lord his God whom he serves. I would say King David is a man who had wealth, strength, and wisdom. He could have boasted in himself all he wanted, but you know who King David boasted in? God. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he's the one who wrote that. I can't remember which psalm it is. King David, a man who, they they would scream in the streets, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. This was a skilled man. This was a wise man. Who do you think taught Solomon everything he needed to hear? King David. You know what? You can you can be the smartest, richest, strongest person in the world, but without Christ, you have nothing. Because when your value is in your strength, when your strength fails, you fail. When your when your value is in your money, when your money fails, you fail. When your strength is in your, wi- or when you boast in your wisdom, when your value is in your wisdom and your wisdom fails you, you lose everything. Let it be in Christ because you know who's never going away? You know who's never going to change? You know who's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Christ. And one day, when we're gone, and Christ is planted, with his kingdom on earth. And every knee will bow. Like we sang this morning. One day every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. I want to be the one that said I did it willingly. Because in a kingdom you have two people who bow. You have those who are forced to. And those who choose to. I don't know about you. But I want to be the one that takes a knee for the king. And says I'll follow you before I'm ever forced to. So next week, we're going to dive, deep dive into value, okay? We're going to go really far into it. We're going to talk about how value affects us, where we get it from. We're going to look at some examples in Scripture of people who did not know their value and as a result of it, ended up in places that they, sh- they didn't need to end up in. And we're going to look at people who are on the right side and peop- on, the, on the good side. They did everything right and had no identity and no value. And we're going to look at people who did everything wrong and had no identity and no value and how when they found repentance, they came back and both of them had value reestablished in their lives and both of them walked different lifestyles. We're going to talk about how important that value is in our lives and we're going to talk about how that value leads us to the next step, which is purpose and then purpose leads us to authority amen thank you god for today thank you for everybody here lord god i just ask that you would bless every single person that's here lord god and that you would challenge them and that you would grow them and that you would increase in them a desire for more of you Holy Spirit, I ask that you would pursue them and that you would open our eyes to greater things in you. Lord God, I ask that you would correct us where we're wrong because your word says that you correct those that you love. And so, Lord God, I ask that you would pour out your love on all of us here, Lord God. And Lord God, that you would give us the strength to walk through it, to repent, and to look more and more like you absolutely every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.